Good evening, church. So good to see you all out. So uh, thankful for the invite here several months ago to come out and spend some time with you. I always enjoy um, having the opportunity to come and, and, and be here with the, the good church here. And I get to see Rod that I've been able to work with for years now on the YOU board and Bruce. Uh, it's just, a, just great coming to see you all and being here with you. The topic I've been asked to speak about comes from Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We begin reading Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Every time I, I read that passage of Scripture, something from my childhood comes to my brain like immediately. And it's a cartoon where there is a sheep that looks just like all the rest of the sheep, and then it stands up on its hind legs and unzips. And it's a wolf, you know, that's got on this outfit that is disguised as a sheep. But, you know, looking at that cartoon and watching that cartoon, as, as you looked at it before he stood up and unzipped, he looked exactly like everything else. Every other sheep around him looked exactly... Now, understand, this is a cartoon. But as I read this passage of Scripture, I think about that, and then I, I think about some of the lessons that are found in this, this passage of Scripture about people who will infiltrate a flock and disguise themselves outwardly to look like everybody else. But when they stand up and unzip, they're a wolf there amongst the sheep. And the damage that can be caused, and, and as Jesus is speaking here, the greatest teacher ever, he says, beware of who? False prophets. These false teachers, these people who come and they disguise themselves a certain way so that they begin to look like everybody else, but what they are doing is trying to set you up. They're trying to set you up and trick everybody. Some people are really good at disguises. Some people are really good at deceiving others. The best deceptor is Satan, of course, and Satan will also disguise himself in sheep's clothing to look like the Christian. Let me tell you how I know. One way that I know is that you go to Matthew chapter 4, and we call this the temptation of Jesus. And what I mean by that is Satan can disguise himself because Satan was quoting Scripture to Jesus as he was trying to tempt him. You see, one thing that we have to understand, that the great deceiver knows the Bible too. Not only does the great deceiver know the Bible, the great deceiver knows the author. The great deceiver knows the author of the Bible. He knows God. He also knows the truth. He also knows that, uh, I, I assume that he knows that he's already been defeated. He's just trying to pull us down with him. And will disguise himself and use anything and anybody that will allow them or allow him to use them to bring sheep over to be devoured. Let me tell you something. You know that Satan will use your spouse against you. Satan will use your children. Satan will use your parents. Satan will use whatever he can to come against you, including Scripture. Scripture. And as you think about false teachers, false teachers are not a new concept. False teaching is not something that just came around. All through Scripture, we are warned about false teachers. All through Scripture, over and over and over again. It's not a new concept. 
and it's all around us. Why? Uh, we're in a small town of Moralton. I don't know how many people live here. I don't know what your population of the small town of Moralton is, but I bet there's all kinds of different churches in Moralton. Why is our world surrounded by different, uh, what we refer to as denominations of churches? When we read the New Testament, we, we understand there's only one church. How come there are so many others? Well, there are teachings that are been, and I'm not saying that we got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. But I know that people have manipulated Scripture to make it say something or try to make it say something that it doesn't say. And they lure people away. But as you continue reading that passage of Scripture, those few verses that we just read, Jesus says, beware of false teachers. But he, then he says, how will you know that they are false? How will you recognize the wolves that are dressed up like sheep? He says, you will recognize them. Read it again. You'll, you'll recognize them by the fruit that they produce. So, we can't just lean on what people say to us. We can't just take the message that comes from the lips of people as the absolute truth. There's a couple of things that we must do. Being in ministry full time, this is hard for me to believe, but I've been at Liberty for 15 years. I've been working with the church at Liberty outside of Conway, in between Conway and Bologna for 15 years. In my time within ministry, you might be surprised or you might not at how many people as we discuss some aspect of Scripture, will come and say to me, but my mama always said. Or growing up, this is what the preacher said. Or grandma and grandpa believe this. We can't just take what people say as truth from God. There's a couple of things that we have to do first. One is we have to understand the teachings of God ourselves. We as Christians must be continually learning from the Word of God. I look out, I don't know very many people here. A lot of your faces look really familiar to me. But a lot of you, I don't know on a, on a deep level. We've got from young to old in here. I don't care how old you are and how many years you've been a Christian, you should still be learning. You should still be a student. I like to think of it as continuing ed. We are continually learning and growing in the Word of God. So that when George gets up here and speak, or Rod gets up here and speak, or the next several weeks when y'all are blessed at the Lord's willing, with David Riley coming and speaking to y'all, it's not just listening to what they say and saying, that's absolutely true, I'm hanging on to that. It's taking what I say, what they say, what whomever is teaching saying, and comparing it to the Word of God, and taking that message to the message, and developing my truth and my faith from the truth, which is the Word of God. So we must know the Word of God in order to be able to say that's truth or that's a false teacher. In order to understand what is true or what is false, you have to have a standard to measure it by. The standard is the Word of God. It's not what Mama said. It's a hard truth for people to grasp from time to time. It's not what your preacher said. It's not, that doesn't make it true just because... Another thing. Just because you read it somewhere doesn't make it true. There is this... Hmm, there is this... Um, struggle with some people and it's more difficult for some of a certain generation to take anything that is read that is typed out to be absolute truth if it is typed it must be true that's why you have some people of a certain generations that will share things on Facebook and then their children or grandchildren have to call them and say, Mama, I'll take that down. <laughs> Just because it is in some form of type print does not make it true. You have to make sure the thing that you are developing your life and your belief system around is the absolute truth. 
which is found in the Word of God. So before we can recognize wolves in sheep's clothing, we have to have a standard to understand truth from falsehood. A problem in our society, in the so-called religious circle, is that people do not have any biblical knowledge. And I can tell you, it's not just outside of the walls of Church of Christ buildings. It's sometimes inside the walls too. We have to have a knowledge. We have to be continually learning from the Word of God. Continually study. And that's one thing, this is extra, not even in my notes. Th- th- that is one thing that blows my mind, and it's easy to blow my mind, quite simple, that blows my mind about Scripture is that I can study it the thousandth time and gain something from it. I can study it a thousand times and listen and have a conversation with my daddy and gain something, a new insight from that passage of Scripture that I've went over, that I've preached from, that I've written papers from, that I've presented from, and still say, I've never caught that before. It's one thing to me uh, that makes that Scripture true, something like living, active, breathing. It never goes out of date. And it blows my mind. Because everything that I have ever experienced expires. Got the newest iPhone? I don't know what that is. What number are we on now? Look, y'all know. What is it? 15? The, the iPhone 15, 14, 17, whatever it is. You go buy it tomorrow, Friday, it'll be out of date. I remember when flat screens t- TV were like, whoa. And now they're flat screen and flat. And those are out of date. Everything goes out of date except for the Word of God. It don't get old. And, and it blows my mind to think this was written, the New Testament portion was lived out and then written going on 2,000 years ago. And it's still applicable today as it was then. And that blows my mind. And if you just think of it as an old book and you don't study it, you'll not, you don't understand that. If you're in it, you understand exactly what I'm saying. We've got to be students continuing our knowledge and understanding of Scripture no matter how old we become. So the first question for you, for me, is how am I studying so that that I am able to recognize false teachers? Then Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know false teachers by the fruit that they produce. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. We have to not be walking around with our heads in a cloud. Or not be tricked by the, the ability of someone to speak by somebody's charisma. Or get this, by the way someone makes you feel. by the way that someone makes you feel. Now, participating in worship and studying the Word of God can produce emotions inside of you, as it should, just like it did the Jews in Acts chapter 2. When they heard the message of the gospel that was preached, it says they were pierced to the heart. What does that mean? They had an emotional reaction to the message that was just given and based upon that emotional reaction to the message that was preached by Peter and the rest of the apostles they said they were pierced to the heart and said what must we do to be saved and the Peter I mean the apostles kept on teaching and they were added to the church now we can have an emotional reaction to a song in worship have you ever been singing a song pouring your heart out to God through song and been overtaken by the emotions of that song. Yes. A couple of songs do it to me every single time. And it's because of an association that I have with people 
that those songs get to me emotionally. One of them is when all of God's singers get home. And that takes me to my Aunt Jerry Sue, who passed away. She's a huge influence on my life and my faith development. She died when I was 16 years old. She was in her early 40s. And every time we sing that song, I still see and hear my Aunt Jerry Sue. It causes an emotional reaction. It's about this relationship with God to me. And it's about this relationship with my Aunt Jerisu who helped introduce me to God as a young child. We do sometimes have an emotional response to a message or a song, but the emotional response does not equate truth. And the emotional response does not mean I must be doing something right. You know how I know. Please ask me how. How? Because I can go get in the car right now and drive home and turn the radio on and have an emotional response to a 1992 song from the country music. And it can make me feel some type of way about this song that was on the radio. That don't mean I'm worshiping God. That don't mean it's right because I had emotional response to the song. One way that false teachers overtake some people is by creating an emotional response. And people think, because I felt it, it must be true. And so I'm going to follow that line of doctrine because I feel it when I'm there. When you make decisions based upon your feelings, you will mess up. Ask me how I know. Proverbs. Do not lean on your own understanding you lean on your own understanding you lean on your own emotions you lean on your own way of thinking you're gonna get yourself in trouble so we have to make sure as we are being aware and watching out for false teachers that we're seeing the fruit that is produced and that the, the fruit that is being taught or given is not leading you to make a decision based upon what it's making you feel. Now, I am not the type, I'm not a stoic worshiper. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but that's not me. I have emotional responses within worship, and I think that that is good. I have emotional connections during worship, and it can be, a lot of times, there's a whole lot of joy. And sometimes it's, it's the opposite. Based upon who I am and where I've come from and what I've been doing and what I'm experiencing, I'm, I think those emotional responses are okay as long as they are accompanied by what is true. And what I feel doesn't make it true. So as we begin to be aware and watch out for false teachers, Watch the fruit that is being produced because sometimes bad fruit is disguised as good. Disguised as it's good. Have you ever experienced that physically? You ever went to the grocery store or the farmer's market and bought the most beautiful apple from the outside? And you get that beautiful apple, and if, maybe you like apples anyway. And you take it home and you cut it open, or you just wash it off and you bite into it, and it's brown. Or maybe you just looked at one side of it, and you turned it over and the back side was mushy. Or maybe a worm had gotten in it. See, what happened was what you saw on the outside was not what was there on the inside. Beware of false teachers who look like sheep but are disguised and they're actually wolves. You've got to have a basis for truth to be able to recognize it. And we can't be walking around with our heads in a cloud, not observing and paying attention to those we are surrounding ourselves with and developing our faith off of their message.
beware of false teachers who come in and begin to manipulate the Word of God. Also begin to manipulate other people. See, they'll have to answer for that. They'll have to answer for it. But they won't have to answer for you. They won't have to answer for me. I will. We'll get there in just a few more minutes. Ooh, this time goes by way too fast. All right, let's turn over. We're going to come back. Hold your finger here, but turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4 real fast. Second Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. This is Paul giving Timothy, a young minister, this, this distinct instruction about preaching the word of God and what it does. Preach the word and always be ready. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul giving this instruction to Timothy. He says, you've got to stay preaching the truth. And as you preach the truth, it'll do some things. You reprove, you rebuke, you exhort. That, that's what the Word of God will do. You stay to that, he says. But a time will come, comma, this is my input. This is not inspired. This is Jonathan's version. A time will come, comma, and is here, comma, when people will accumulate for themselves people who will tell them what they want to hear. People who will tell them what they want to hear so that all I can do is come to church and feel good and do me outside of this building. When I leave, I can do whatever I want to do because I believe. And the Bible says, they who believe in Him will not perish. So all I have to do is believe. Don't do nothing with it. Don't do nothing with that belief. And don't repent. Don't live by Scripture. I won't live for me, but I believe. And there is no way that a loving God could condemn His own creation. Do you believe? I'll see you on the other side. Now, I, I can't condemn anybody. I don't have the authority to condemn anybody. I can preach what the, the Word teaches. And I believe what God says. But he's the judge. But there's a time when people will accumulate things they want to hear. You know what? I, I'm, I would be willing to say that probably when Paul wrote this to Timothy, it was already happening. Because human nature is, we like to be told, you're doing good. Don't change anything about yourself. You're doing good. It's interesting. Long before I was in full-time ministry, people would come who were caught up in some kind of struggle. And they would want my advice until my advice didn't align with what they have already made up in their mind was the right thing to do. And do you know what sometimes would happen? Instead of talking about it, Instead of, maybe they were right, maybe I was wrong. But instead of, sometimes what would happen, instead of talking about it, they would go find somebody else. And then when somebody else would tell them the exact same thing that I told them, they'd leave them and go find somebody else. And if they said the same thing we said, they'd leave them and go find somebody else until they found somebody that told them they think they should do exactly what they already made up in their mind they were going to do. And now they got a support system. They have found themselves somebody to tell them what they want to hear. That's what humans do. That's what people do. Now, I'm looking out at you, and I know you have never done that. Why you? Why did it, a lot of people laugh? 
because we can all relate. But when you're thinking from a spiritual perspective, from a spiritual perspective that has an eternal message with an eternal consequence, it's much more dangerous at whether I should quit my job or not. Or whether this boyfriend or girlfriend is good for me at 15 years old. Much more eternal consequence. It says people are going to accumulate for themselves. You preacher, you minister, Timothy. People are going to accumulate for themselves people they want to hear. Now what you do is you keep preaching the truth. Don't change the message that you have heard and seen in me, your spiritual father. You keep preaching the truth. Paul even says at one point, if anybody comes and teaches something different than what we have told you, even if it's me, may we all be accursed. You stick to that true gospel message even when people don't want to hear it. It becomes discouraging as an evangelist. That's not just me, you, and you. If me, you, and you are the only ministers in this room, there's a problem. All Christians, all disciples are ministers. And as ministers, it can become discouraging as we try to bring people to Christ and they won't listen. When we try to develop relationships with people to show them the message of the gospel and they begin to ask questions and you begin to answer those questions, not with your own thoughts, but with the word of God. And they just don't want to receive it. It can become discouraging. And see, as a minister, there, there, this is a big auditorium. I have a big auditorium. There's a lot of empty pews in here. Same. And about every church I go to, visit that, same. But you go to Chick-fil-A on a Monday night and say, free chicken sandwich. You won't be able to get in the door. You turn on your TV or more so go online and you watch a preacher that is preaching something that is false and see the camera pan that audience. That'll be full from the front to the back. I was told one time, I don't know how true this is, I was told one time about uh, one that I would consider a false teacher in Texas that you had to buy a ticket to go to worship. And the further up front, the more the ticket was, just like at a concert. They had paid parking in the parking lot. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'm just telling you that's something I was told. You see, if I begin to preach a message that is, come here, believe, don't change, don't challenge yourself, do whatever feels good, do whatever feels right, as long as you believe, I believe that I could fill up some church buildings as a false teacher who did it in the name of Jesus, so-called name of Jesus. Paul says to Timothy, you be sound. You keep preaching. Do not waver from the truth. Even when the people that are surrounding you are accumulating for themselves people who will just tell them what they want to hear. Don't do it. You keep on, and I love that last little phrase that I read. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. You fulfill your ministry. All of your ministry in here is not preaching. All of your ministry is not song leading. All of your ministry is not nursery teaching. All of y'all's ministry is not VBS. All of your ministry is not cooking. All of your ministry is not sewing. All of your ministry is not sending cards. We all have different ministries. God has given different talents and abilities and opportunities and experiences to all of us so that His church as a body can flourish. Fulfill your ministry. And because your ministry may be different than mine, it doesn't change the message. Our message is the same. Our outreach is different. Don't go changing the message. And be able to recognize it when someone else is. So, do you know the Word of God? 
And are you continuing to learn and grow in the Word of God? As you are doing that, are you able to recognize when people around you are trying to get a belief system taught that is wrong, even if it's inside these walls? Even if it's somebody who says they're a member of the Church of Christ, just because somebody claims to be a member of the Church of Christ, that is not a one-way ticket into heaven. Make sure the fruit that is being produced with the lessons taught is truth from the Word of God. Not manipulated, not distorted. And as you recognize that, fulfill your ministry. Never wavering from the truth. So as you go back over to Matthew chapter 7, and you look towards the end of the passage that we were reading, we got to look before I run out of time, about the outcome. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This warning that Jesus gives. This warning that is, that is given here by Jesus himself. He is warning about false teachers. And then the, the warning about false teachers leads to judgment. The warning about false teachers leads to judgment. And he says, not everyone who says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But who? But he who does. I like that in your Bible. He who does the will of my Father, He will enter. They will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these wonderful works in Your name? And He says, one of the scariest lines in the Bible, depart from me. He don't even just say, I don't know you. He doesn't say, I used to know you. He said, I never knew you. One thing that that says to me is that the day of judgment, I don't know what the day of judgment is going to look like. Some people profess to know exactly what that's going to look like. I don't know. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I know that I'm going to have to give an account for me. And you will have to give an account for you. I know that every one of us will stand before God and give an account and we'll be judged based upon what we have done here compared to that word. I know that, but I don't know exactly what it looks like. But he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And you will say, some will say or many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all this stuff in your name and depart from me. I never knew you. You know, one thing that that tells me is there's going to be some shocked people at judgment. There will be shocked people at judgment. There will be shocked people because the way that they had developed their belief system and the actions that followed it were led away from the Word of God. And in this particular teaching, how were these groups of people led away? Beware of false teachers. Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? You see, I believe that there are some genuine false teachers. I don't believe that all false teachers are false teachers on purpose. I don't believe that all false teachers read the Word of God and say, okay, I'm going to distort this part, I'm going to leave this part, I'm going to take this out, and I'm going to go share it with somebody else just to get followers. Now, some might, but I don't believe that all false teachers do it on purpose. And I am next to certain that all followers don't know that. You know, I, I've had this conversation before and I find it interesting the longer I think about it. There'll be people who are shocked that they're lost. But those of us who are saved shouldn't be shocked. Not, sh not I don't mean shocked that they were lost, but we shouldn't be shocked that we were saved. I think that sometimes Christians don't have enough confidence in our salvation. We're afraid that confidence equates arrogance and it doesn't. There's a huge difference in being confident and being arrogant. I am confident that God is a fulfiller of His promises. 
And because God has promised the faithful an eternity in His presence, I can be confident before God. I can bow before God in complete humility, humble as humble, I better be humble, as humble can be, and still not be shocked when He says, Welcome home. Or enter in, my good and faithful servant. You see, we shouldn't be shocked at judgment. Those who will be shocked are those who have not done the will of the Father. Lord, Lord, do we not do all these wonderful things in your name? Depart from me. I don't know you. That's what false teaching leads to. So as we think about that, do you have a false sense of security in your salvation? I'm afraid that you and I are surrounded by people who we care about, who we love, who have a false sense of security about their salvation. I told you 10, 10, 12 minutes ago, I can't condemn anybody. I don't have that authority. I can't save anybody either. I don't have that authority. I just have access to the one who does. I know how to get to the one who does. You do too. False sense of security. Sometimes people ask me, what's the hardest thing about being in ministry full time? Think about that. George, you've been in a long time. How would you answer that question? My response to that question usually is, it depends on the day. But oftentimes people ask that question when you're in a a season or a moment of funerals. Is doing funerals the hardest part of being a full-time minister? One of them. But let me tell you, funerals are hard for different reasons. I can't condemn, nor can I save anybody. But we do certain funerals where we have a, the way I word it is, I have a, a higher level of confidence in their salvation than theirs. Why? Well, go back to John, I mean, Matthew chapter 7, by the fruit that I saw that was produced. By what I know about Scripture and what I know about their lives. Are they saved or are they not? I can't answer that question. I'm not the judge. But what I can say is as I preached my Memo Bonnie's funeral two summers ago, me and Memo were like this. I could do sermons on Memo. I was blessed to have Memo for 37 years. She lived to be 87 year old, years old and had full mental capacity, which was wonderful. At 86 years old, she's the one that you call and say, Memo, I've got a meeting tomorrow at 10. She'll call you at 9.45 to remind you about your meeting at 10. That's how her memory worked. She was the one that when I couldn't get, mom or daddy couldn't go to Bible class on Sunday morning, she picked you up, take you to Bible class. She's the memo that had a snack after school every day waiting on you when you got there. And let me tell you a little secret. You need to try peanut butter and pickles. <laughs> Just trust me and have an open mind. A snack that we used to have with Mamma Bonnie. If you have any questions about that, just ask me. I'll, t- I'll coach you through it. Don't knock it. But when Mamma told me that I was going to speak at her funeral, I said, no, 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 I can't do that. Oh, yeah, you're going to do it. And you say what? Yes, ma'am. Her funeral was very, very, very hard for me to do. But it wasn't because I was worried about her eternity. It's because I miss her. And I had such a close relationship with her. And I was talking to my sister Monday morning. And I said, we were talking about Memo. And I said, you know what's crazy? Memo's been gone for over two years. And sometimes I go to pick up my phone to call her. It's been over two years. That funeral was very difficult. But it's because I miss her. I have done other funerals, including family members. 
that were difficult for a much different reason. It's because I knew how they lived their life and I know what Scripture teaches. And I've been asked many times, John, how do you do funerals look like that? And I say, you talk to the family. And you talk to the family about the process of grief. And you may share some stories about their life, but you don't say they're, or I don't, I don't preach them into heaven, if you will. I don't have that authority. I don't preach them into hell either. I don't have that authority. But it's difficult for different reasons. As you read this passage of Scripture, it's one of the Scriptures from Matthew chapter 7 that I was asked to speak about that really points to judgment. And one thing that I think is very, very important that we gain from this message from Jesus, real life today in 2023, is do not leave your salvation to a man. You have to develop your own based upon what you are taught and compare it to the truth, the Word of God, so that at the end, when you get to judgment, you aren't shocked. So that you haven't developed this whole life and belief system around something that wasn't true. Be aware. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And a couple of things that are in my notes, but we're not going to get to, so I'm going to just kind of give you the highlights of it because we're out of time almost. Don't become... Write this down so you can think about it. Because some of it is going to go over... You're not, if you're not paying attention, you ain't going to get it. So write this down real fast or put it in your phone. Don't become your own false teacher. Don't become your own wolf in sheep's clothing. Because I'm afraid that far too often we are manipulated in our minds by Satan to justify our sinful behavior based upon justifications that make sense in your own mind. Dwell on that. Don't become your own wolf in sheep's clothing. I see the look. Some of you are like, oh, I want to think about that. Some of you are completely confused. That's okay. Think about it. Don't become your own wolf. And two, the last thing that I'm going to leave you with, when you think about this passage about wolves in sheep's clothing, he says, beware of a wolf dressed like a sheep because you are what? You're a sheep. You're a part of the flock. Have courage in knowing that if, if you're a, a faithful disciple, you're a member of the flock. Have courage to know that you have the good shepherd on your side. That God is the ultimate shepherd. And the Gospels tell us that the good shepherd knows his sheep. And his sheep know him. And it says to us that, that the sheep know His voice. The sheep know His voice. How do you know the voice of God? How is the voice of God revealed to you now? It's in His Word. But the idea, the reality, that He is the shepherd and we are the sheep and He knows us and we know Him. It's interesting to me when you think about animals in this sense, the sheep, I have a little dog that looks like a miniature sheep. She's all white, this big. And she's 12 and a half years old. We had her, Haley and I, my wife, we had her before we had children. Our oldest child is nine, so we had her three and a half years before we had him. And she's rotten. She's not real bright, but she's rotten. And she drives my wife insane. Some of you can relate because a lot of times the dog has one master. Mia, our little Maltese, will listen to me and she will not listen to Haley. She'll go outside to go potty and Haley will slam the door and come in. She's like, go get your dog. She will not come in. We don't have a fence or nothing. I go out there and say, Mia, get in here. Here she comes trotting. Because 
she responds to my voice. When another voice comes in, she ain't going to listen. Domesticated animals are like that a lot of times. You can see uh, herds of cattle respond to a particular whistle or a particular sound. And they come. Daddy was real good with horses and he could get a horse to do something that nobody else could get it to do. Responded to him, wouldn't respond to nobody else. Do you know the good shepherd? Because when the good shepherd speaks, how does he speak to us now? Through his word. We know his voice. So when somebody else comes in and tries to lure us away, tries to pull us away as a different shepherd, we won't respond because we know who the shepherd is. We know who my, my shepherd is. I'm going to listen to him. So as you think about your life, your relationship with God, where's it at? You see, some of us may have come here this evening with a false sense of security. A false sense of security and confidence. Because we've been listening to someone that's different than what the Word of God teaches. You've got to change. You've got to make the necessary changes so that you're... What did you say? Those who do the will of the Father. Willing. Not just here. They do. That's the wise man and the foolish man. They received the same message. The wise did it, the foolish didn't. Where are you at in your relationship and your obedience to God? There might be those here who need prayers of strength, prayers of encouragement, prayers of forgiveness, and there might be those here who are sitting here confused. Because you've been told something your whole life that you've developed a belief in, but now, now you're beginning to gain some deeper understanding of the Word of God and saying everything I've been told and everything that I've seen and witnessed does not line up with what I'm seeing in Scripture. You might be confused. That's okay. Except that you're confused and find clarity. Find clarity through the Word of God. And I know you have men here that would love to help you find that clarity, not by their opinion, but help the Word of God guide you so that you gain clarity. you got to let us know or let them know so they can help. There might be those who haven't been obedient to that message of the gospel. You've heard the message. You believe the message. You just haven't done anything with it yet. You might be ready to respond to that message by changing your life and stop living for you or living for somebody else. We call that repentance and begin to live for God. Making Him the number one priority. You're not going to be perfect. You're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, think the wrong thing from time to time. Christianity is a process. It's a growing process that never stops until our breath here is done. If you quit growing as a Christian because you've been a Christian for 75 years, you've got a problem. There's no retirement plan while still on this earth for the Christian. You're ready to confess with your mouth, stand before brothers and sisters in Christ and say that you believe in Jesus. But the way I like to think about confession is not just a one-time confession with my mouth, but it's a life of confession outside of these walls. That the choices that I make, the way that I choose to live my life and interact with people, including the people inside of my home, and works its way out. My life is a lifestyle of confession that I belong to Him. You're ready to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, cleansed, washed, made new, made pure, and then live faithfully till you take your last breath or Christ returns, whichever comes. And you may be ready to make that decision. Don't wait. Don't wait. If you got a need, just let us know. As together we stand and sing.